in his masterpiece, Imperialism, The Highest Stage of Capitalism, which is available in the bookshop, um, Lenin says that uh, imperialism is based on the development of the capitalist economy to the point of um, a concentration in the form of monopolies. Um, so he doesn't base himself just on the, you know, the, the world relations, the colonialism, the politics of imperialism, but he finds an economic basis for it uh, in monopoly capital. Of course, originally uh, capitalism, as he explains, was based more on free competition and smaller, mainly smaller businesses developing around new technologies and, uh, and uh, expanding into the market. But of course, that competition in itself ends up negating itself into monopoly. In other words, it's precisely through the mechanism of competition that uh, competition is eliminated because through competition, uh, less efficient firms or outdated firms, whatever, are outcompeted, uh, are destroyed basically. And you have over time a concentration of capital into larger and larger uh, organisations or businesses basically, uh, and but fewer businesses at the same time. I think today we can certainly see quite clearly in the statistics the result of that process with these giant multinational corporations. So it's ironically through the process of competition that competition is uh, limited or, uh, eliminated or, or at least undermined. And these giant monopolies um, that emerge from this process that really began to emerge in the late 19th century, of course, uh, develop a massive surplus of capital because they concentrate so much wealth within their hands, they develop a surplus uh, more than they actually can uh, reasonably invest, at least for their home market. Um, and uh, additionally, their scale and their efficiency and they're having conquered all the key kind of strategic positions in the market um, tends to be, provide a barrier for the, for the entry of, of, of new or smaller firms into the market. It becomes so expensive, you need so much capital to produce a car efficiently or something like that, that you basically can't uh, and therefore it's, you end up having this barrier uh, to competition. And then also with that a surplus of capital, too much wealth concentrated in too few hands. Uh, and I think again you can see that quite graphically today with the, the uh, lack of investment in, in the economy and the concentration in a few firms' hands of staggering amounts of wealth. Uh, to give the most uh, glaring example of this is Apple, of course, one of the, possibly the biggest company in the world. Uh, and they apparently, I read the other day, have cash reserves, unspent, un uninvested cash reserves of $230 billion they've just accumulated. Now that's the most egregious example of this, but there are obviously uh, many, many giant corporations uh, sitting on huge piles of cash, essentially. And for this reason, and this provides the sort of mechanism or the, the underlying um, most driving force of imperialism, these giant corporations are not able to, for not, don't, not finding um, enough room, if you like, in the home market for themselves and having too much capital, begin ex exporting their capital uh, to uh, other countries where super profits can be made because the cost of labour is lower, basically. Um, and, uh, and of course in doing so they open up also new markets for themselves, so they produce more cheaply and they open up new markets for themselves. And, and, and for that reason you have of course on top of this the political uh, phenomena of imperialism, in other words the, the development of, of colonies and things like that. And so Lenin ex uh, identified not only monopoly but uh, um, uh, capital as characteristic, but specifically the exporting of capital um, to uh, other countries, to usually undeveloped countries or non-capitalist countries, pre-capitalist countries, saying, this is what he said, he says, capital has become overripe and, owing to the backward state of agriculture and the poverty of the masses, capital cannot find a field for profitable investment. It's interesting that he adds the caveat uh, that there's a, a lack of, uh, that it's, it's owing to the poverty of the masses, they cannot find 
because it's not as if to say that the, we're too rich necessarily in these countries. There isn't useful things to be done, but that actually, almost in a sense, we're too poor. Uh, that the, the working class, of course, cannot just absorb the endless commodities that can be produced by these companies, and therefore they have to go abroad. And this was brilliantly summed up in a quote uh, from um, the, uh, an American senator in the 1890s. Uh, this is at the time that the United States was, of course, beginning to see that it could eclipse Britain. Uh, I think around that time it actually began to outcompete Britain in, in manufacturing. Uh, a senator for Indiana called Albert Beveridge said, U.S. factories are making more than people can possibly use, and U.S. soil is making more than people can possibly consume. Fate has written our policy for us. The trade of the world shall be ours. We must establish trading posts throughout the world as just distributing posts, points for American goods. And I think that really sums up the link between the surface appearance of imperialism, in, in other words, the politics of it, the world relations, the establishment of colonies and dependent countries, and the economic foundation for that, in other words, the overproduction, the overaccumulation of capital in certain countries. How, and, and of course, this also creates a situation in which you have dominating countries and dominated countries, where you have powerful countries that exploit other countries and, and hold them back and, and keep them in a backward state of development. However, we also have to see the other side of the equation. It's not just, as, it's not just the case that imperialism does that. Lenin also points out, as he says, and this is a quote, that uh, on the other hand, capital, sorry, imperialism, the export of capital in imperialism influences and accelerates the development of capitalism elsewhere to, to those countries in which capital is exported. So on the one hand, it, it does establish a relationship of dominance uh, and subservience, but on the other hand, it does also accelerate, perhaps in a very distorted and, and, and one-sided and unhealthy manner, but it certainly does accelerate at the same time the development of capitalism in other countries. So imperialism is, as he said, the highest stage of capitalism. But it isn't the final, or it isn't without its own stages. It does have within itself unevenness. In fact, it's based on unevenness, of course, to begin with. It's based on the fact that some countries and companies become much wealthier and more advanced and developed than others and therefore can exploit them. Uh, and it may appear for a period of time as if that creates a certain world order in which there's a degree of peace and security and uh, almost the planning of the world's economy. And you do have that in the epoch, for instance, in the mid-20th century, the, the epoch of globalization under American domination after the Second World War. You have a, a relative period of, I, I, I stress relative, uh, period of peace and stability in which living standards grew enormously under the so-called, you know, the Pax Americana. Um, and you had the similar phenomena in the late 19th century under British domination. So it may appear as if it sort of organises the world into one very unjust, but nevertheless very kind of peaceful and established system, uh, providing a basis for growth on the dominating power's terms. But it's not as simple as that. It also, being based precisely on this unevenness, it also uh, develops unevenly. And as Trotsky said, there is a certain privilege of backwardness. There's a certain privilege of being late to the party having low costs of labour and also being able to learn the lessons and not have to repeat all of the same processes of the imperialist must, being able to import the latest technology. It also provides certain benefits, at least for some countries, some backward countries, who can then grow much more quickly than even the imperial master uh, uh, is able to do so. And therefore you have in the process of, of, of imperialist development um, a, cha a shifting of the relative power and influence of the different powers, the emergence of new powers, the emergence of new wealth in other parts of the world, and therefore an unsettling of this balance of forces in world relations over a period of time. And I think, of course, that is the reason that we've put this topic on the agenda, is to understand just such a period that we are living through uh, at the moment. Now, Lenin added that monopoly capital uh, also concentrates itself more and more so into finance capital, um, where the economy becomes concentrated into fewer and fewer firms and bigger and bigger concerns, 
the role of finance becomes increasingly important as a kind of nerve centre, an organiser, if you like, for the whole capitalist system. And it signifies a point of development for capitalism in which really it's ripe for socialism because the private character, the small-scale private character of production has been done away with. And actually now, with the domination of finance capital, organising and sort of integrating all of the different companies, you have really kind of socialised production in a certain sense. In other words, one giant division of labour where all of the companies are sort of dependent on each other, e even own bits of each other through share, share ownership and investments of various kinds through the banking system. Uh, and you have therefore this very complicated interweaving of the economy, it, at the centre of which of course is the stock market, the banks and other financial institutions. And therefore it, uh, doing away with the kind of primitive, um, low-level um, and private character, small-scale character of early capitalism and therefore ripe for socialism, ripe for, for organising the world economy on a, on a collective basis. <coughs> Also, with the concentration of capital into giant, not only monopolies, but specifically financial institutions, all owning bits of each other, having stakes in bits of each other, as is the case, you also have, therefore, the possibility of a very close enmeshing and interweaving of the interests and the influence of these corporations and the states which is, after all, the bourgeois state. Marx, of course, described the bourgeois states as like a committee for organising the affairs, an executive committee of the bourgeoisie, essentially. Uh, and if that is the case, then of course, when, once the bourgeoisie has become concentrated into these giant firms, these giant monopolies, all knowing each other and being uh, having a very close relationship with each other, then of course, naturally, they tend to have a very intimate relationship with the state apparatus as well. So you have this tendency to have uh, national champions, if you like, N you know, national corporations that sort of represent the fate and the interests of that uh, country, of that bourgeois state. And the bourgeois state becoming like a representative of the business of that country on the world stage. Those businesses, as I've said, of course, having to export capital, having to go into other countries, outsourcing and other kinds of things in order to continue expanding and competing on the world stage. Then the nation state, which is so closely tied up with these concerns, of course, takes it upon itself to help them in those endeavours, you know, to invade other countries or to secure the unnecessary alliances, to secure the, the security apparatus that is needed the, and the infrastructure that is needed to lubricate world trade and to make sure that your companies uh, are the ones that are doing well. And, and you frequently see it that the likes of um, Theresa May and other politicians, when they make their trips, they often take a cohort of leading businessmen with them. You, and if you actually read the reports of their trip to this or that country, they'll have like 40 or 50 business. When Iran opened itself up, for instance, to world trade after signing its deal with America uh, a year or two ago, you had all of, these, <laughs> all of these leading politicians taking with them a little army of business or prominent businessmen to suss out basically what kind of opportunities there were to exploit that market, that new market. Market. So indeed you have a, a, the ending really of real free competition in the modern era and, and the domination of enormous corporations over everything. You also have the use of these financial institutions to uh, not only to, to make money out of other countries by you know, facilitating the export of capital, but also as a means of control and domination. Um, you have, of course, the, the use of credit, of lending money to other countries uh, through the banks and sometimes through institutions like the World Bank to, to, yes, help development take place, but also make sure that development happens on your terms and to dom further dominate those countries. And on this point, it has to be emphasised that ca imperialism certainly does hold back and hamper the development of many countries throughout the world. I think most of us are familiar with the fact that many uh, colonial or ex-colonial countries are in basically debt bondage to 
the imperialist countries and have paid back their debts to them really many times over but the the interest rates of course require them to keep them and they can never get out of this cycle of debt and really that's the the reason why so much of the world like sub-saharan africa remains in a, uh, a situation of extraordinary poverty poverty and, and and backwardness is being kept in that position by the financial institutions of imperialism really um, and has not been able to develop and it's, it's crazy that in the 21st century with the technology that we have today that so much of the world lives in this kind of condition and it, it's totally unnecessary from an uh, sort of technological point of view, but it's be kept that way by the economic system that we live under. Uh, another phenomenon that Lenin identifies with imperialism is the phenomenon of social chauvinism, um, which is where basically the, the fruits of imperial domination are utilised in order to sort of buy off and bribe the labour movement. I wouldn't necessarily say the working class. I put the emphasis on the labour movement because it's not really the working class that is bri You can't really bribe the whole working class. It's the leaders or it's the s more privileged and influential sections of the working class that were uh, bought off. Uh, the labour aristocracy, as it was called. And Lenin talks about this in, in imperialism in the book. He, I think he quote, I think it's, is it Cecil Rhodes? It's some British imperialist, I'm not sure exactly if it was Cecil Rhodes, who goes around, I think he go, goes around either labour movement meetings or meetings of the poor of some kind, and he finds enormous poverty and anger, as we know that there was obviously in, in Victorian or late Victorian Britain. Uh, and uh, he says basically imperialism is a bread and butter question. He says, I think he literally uses that phrase, he says we've got to uh, exploit these countries basically so that we can afford to pay our own working class better wages, to get dangle crumbs in front of them basically so that they won't overthrow us. That was literally what he said. So you have uh, reformism, one of the, I would argue, one of the most important influences in the development of reformism, which after all represents the influence of the bourgeoisie and the workers' movement. It represents the idea of compromise and subservience to capitalism, and at best winning some, you know, some small reforms within that system. One of the most important things that made that possible is the existence of imperialism, the existence of the ability to exploit the rest of the world, to develop a, obviously a tremendous wealth within certain in key countries who can then of course afford certain reforms which of course you don't see reforms like we enjoy uh, obviously are losing but nevertheless have enjoyed it in the West you don't see those uh, in many parts of the world and that has enabled not necessarily the bribing of the working class as such but the leaders of the working class who have something therefore to offer their members and, cons and, and obviously uh, are themselves given a cosier a more peaceful kind of uh, career for themselves, really, um, and that, that's a very important phenomena uh, that was that was identified by Lenin and many others at the time. And, and out of that, and this relates to the talk we just had on fascism, that is also one of the most important influences, I think, behind fascism and racism in the modern sense of the term. This uh, creation of a privileged section of the working class. You know, this in, in Britain, for instance, uh, uh, the, the working class was given the idea that it was part of a special nation, a special race of people superior to other parts of the world who we were civilizing. And, uh, you know, it gave them a certain sense of their own importance, if you like. It enabled the slave to look down upon a slave beneath themselves. Uh, that sort of ideology was obviously deliberately propagated. And we live with the... Um, the, the wreckage of that really today, when you see, insofar as it is true that working class people might support, might support anti-immigrant policies, British jobs for British workers, the idea that obviously other peoples like Muslim peoples are not welcome here and they're beneath us, they're less, etc. That really, that is the heritage I think of, of that kind of ideology which was promoted uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in particular. Um, where am I? Okay, so <clears throat> finally in terms of characterising imperialism in general, um, of course the book is called The Highest Stage of Capitalism, um, meaning it's really completed, capitalism has completed its historic mission by the time it has evolved into imperialism.
By the time imperialism comes to dominate the world, that means, of course, that capitalism dominates the world. The whole world is organised really into one giant capitalist set of relations, one giant market, of course, in which there are winners and losers, but nevertheless one giant market. And that means uh, that uh, really capitalism has succeeded. It's conquered the world. It's organised one giant division of labour and um, sucked every kind of social system into itself. And it really has nowhere else to take the world. It has socialised production. It's taken it into the realm of, of sort of scientific collective management almost. In a sense. Although it's still appropriated privately, the wealth of it is, is taken in by a few private individuals, of course. But it's become like this gigantic international enterprise by the early 20th century. And really there's nothing pr progressive for capitalism to do beyond that point. Uh, you know, it, it's destroyed the sort of village, rural kind of basis for previous production, put it on an urban and scientific basis and uh, organised it internationally. There's really nowhere else for it to go. And that, the fact that it has exhausted its progressive mission and has become therefore objectively a fetter on development, I think can be proven and seen and manifested in, of course, in the First and Second World Wars, those are the most major and obvious examples of it, but in many other, other phenomena, the stagnating of, of the Western world, if you like it, the deindustrialization that you find, in other words, capitalism hitting a certain point of organizing society and then kind of gradually going downhill really, the privatisation of things, all of that is in a sense part of its, of its decay. Um, and, and of course the, 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 the keeping of so much of the world in dire poverty, the inability even hundreds of years after capitalism's emergence of, of, of doing away with that kind of, those kind of conditions, again signifies a very object, very clearly in, in terms of stats and, and real events, the, 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 the limit, the hitting of the limit of what capitalism can do and actually the uh, decaying of the system in reality. Um, and of course the most glaring example of this is World War I and World War II. World War I is a particularly obvious example of the fact that capitalism, or imperialism rather, has organised the world, world economy, into spheres of influence, into divisions of, you know, this imperialist master controlling this section of the world. Uh, so that any further developments, any further shiftings that I talked about in the relations between the different powers, as some develop more quickly than others, means that wars have to be fought in order, you know, there's no more sort of unconquered places simply to take or to suck into the world market, it's already done so. So wars had to be started in order to redivide the world to better fit the new relations of influence uh, that had built up uh, through the economic developments. And there's absolutely nothing progressive of in those wars whatsoever. There's no, uh, and all imperialist wars, and we have to take an opposition for this reason to all imperialist wars. They have nothing progressive to, to bring the world. Uh, obviously, I think in world, the case of World War I and World War II, that is extremely obvious. Uh, but you see it in many other, of course, the, the Iraq war would be another case in point where it was presented as if this is a, a, a war for democracy and for freedom, which we never buy into those ideas anyway because they're abstractions uh, and, and are largely fictitious. But also in this particular case, quite clearly, it was actually a war to conquer spheres of influence and markets and, and specifically oil. That's quite obvious and I think is widely accepted. Um, and so you can see that this allegedly progressive war to bring democracy to people, the real effects of it are entirely reactionary and there's been nothing positive about it whatsoever. So we obviously take a position of opposition to imperialist wars on principle. Uh, we don't get, allow ourselves to get taken in by any talk of democracy or freedom. Um, and we don't see the emergence of new imperialist powers uh, challenging the old ones as progressive either. It doesn't represent a new development, it's just a rearranging of things basically, rearranging the, 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 chair, the deck chairs on the Titanic so to speak. There's nothing progressive about it whatsoever and therefore we oppose all of those wars. Now <clears throat> the reason we're discussing this today I think is because it's become increasingly apparent to many people that there is such a shift taking place in the world at the moment, that the American century 
has, has drawn to a close, obviously literally the 20th century ended, but also that sort of golden era of American domination seems to be on the wane. America seems to be unsure of itself, it seems to be tired and exhausted, doesn't seem to have much of an appetite for intervening in other countries' affairs, seems to be generally losing influence. Uh, the, uh, also is, is obviously experienced economic convulsions and crises, which are also linked, I think. It's not, I think it's not a complete coincidence that the Great Depression took place around the same time of a massive crisis between the imperialist powers. Of course, you can't draw too close a causal link between the two. But, you know, it would stand to reason that once the world is divided up and you have a crisis of imperialism because there's no new markets to be conquered, also that you would tend to have greater economic crises since, you know, overproduction that, uh, would on a global scale would naturally tend to be at its greatest after years of economic development uh, under one imperial power. That, I think, is what has happened in the last period with the, with the crisis since 2008, where the globalisation that took place under American domination has also brought to, to bear a situation where, on the one hand, America has lost market share because the other countries that were being developed under globalisation have obviously taken market share away from the United States. That's what Trump complains so much about. And on the other hand, of course, that growth that has taken place over the last 20 or 30 years, especially in uh, the Pacific region, has also obviously glutted the market, has obviously created an, an enormous crisis of overproduction where there are too many goods being produced or potentially produced to be sold. Um, and so I think what we're interested in answering is whether or not these, there are new imperial powers, whether or not there is a shift in the relations between the world powers, whether there really is the decline of American imperialism, and how do we explain the rise of, for instance, Chinese imperialism, but also other imperial powers? How do we explain that on the basis of the uh, ideas I've just explained? Well, let's look at China, which is, I think, clearly the best example of the uh, new developments taking place. Um, China, first of all, of course, this, the exporting of commodities is not in itself already imperialism. Lenin says that it's the exporting of, commo of, of capital which marks out imperialism. But nevertheless, clearly the basis for that is the exporting of commodities, becoming a leading producer in the world. Britain became an imperial power by being the workshop of the world. And I think it's quite clear that China has uh, put itself in an... In an frankly unassailable position in terms of manufacturing and is indeed exporting its goods all over the world like no others are. China has become the number one trader in the world and the number one manufacturer in the world. Uh, between 2011 and 2013 China poured 50% more concrete than the United States did in the entire 20th century, which after all was called the American century. And yet in only two years, China poured 50% more than America did in that entire stretch of time. China, as I said, is the largest manufacturer in the world and accounts for about a quarter of all value in the global manufacturing sector. China's coal industry is as big as the rest of the world's put together. And uh, by 2019, it's thought, sorry, by 2018, it's thought that China will have uh, capacity utilisation in coal of, of, of only 50%. In other words, it will only be able to consume 50% of the coal that it has the capacity to produce. Um, and of course, it has plans, therefore, to export much of its coal because it can't consume all the... It's built up such a capacity to produce coal. Uh, and it needs to export it because it can't consume it all itself. China produces over half of all of the world's aluminium, uh, which has led to a collapse in the prices of aluminium competitors, competitors around the world. China has an overcapacity in oil refining by 200 million tonnes a year. Uh, and uh, in 2014, Chinese refiners were thought to be running uh, only two-thirds capacity because they simply couldn't, again, use up all of the refined oil, in other words, the petrol and other things that they have the capacity to make. And therefore, they've um, massively increased their exporting of diesel and other, other products of refined oil in the last few years by 79% in 2015. 
Also, the overcapacity in the Chinese chemical industry has just completely destroyed all of the profits, the entire profits of the Japanese chemical industry. Um, and in steel, I think many of us are aware of the domination of China because it's helped to lead to the collapse of the steel industry in the UK. Uh, and it's quite ironic, actually, because Mao, in the Great Leap Forward, in the 1950s insisted that China in a few years would overtake Britain and America in terms of steel production. Of course it didn't and he had a, quite a crazy scheme for doing so which I won't go into but it has now easily comfortably overtaken Britain and America and in fact it, again in only two years China has produced more steel than Britain has in its entire history uh, and is now producing over half of all the world's steel. And again, of course, there's enormous overcapacity in the Chinese steel industry. It only uses up about a third, sorry, two thirds of, of, the, of the blast furnaces that has actually built. And what this means is that this massive overcapacity means that it's terrified of unemployment at home. The, the Chinese government lives in terror of unemployment because it has really, or like any ruling class, bases itself on its ability to take the economy forward. It's probably the Chinese have based themselves on that even more so than other countries. So if there's unemployment, if there's a wave of unemployment because of this overcapacity, because they can't use all of their factories and factory workers, because there's simply not enough demand for those goods, what are they going to do? So they need to export that capacity, first of all by selling it overseas, but even by then sending those workers and sending the, the, the capital of those companies overseas to develop new markets for Chinese steel, for Chinese cement, etc. in less developed parts of the world where labour is cheaper, but also where the market uh, has yet to be really developed. Um, but also, uh, I think it's interesting to note regarding this question of social chauvinism and of racism and fascism, that you can also see a development, I think, in China of a, of a kind of social chauvinism uh, within uh, society uh, as an attempt to promote Chinese influence essentially and to promote the Han Chinese who are the vast majority of China as a sort of special people. So China of course has this policy of flooding Tibet and Xinjiang with Han Chinese people and very much kind of uh, you know, oppressing or, or um, giving worse opportunities to and uh, undermining the culture of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang and the Tibetans in Tibet um, and giving all the jobs to the Han Chinese. Uh, but also internationally China has a policy of, of if anyone is Han Chinese or basically saying that they are Chinese even if they're born in another country and from another country, they, they see them as really part of greater China and responsible to China. They promote that kind of ideology whereas within China, even if you're born in China but you're not Han, then there's a sort of, you have a less privileged status. There's, there's the, an attempt to create a kind of an, uh, a sort of quasi-racist ideology of, of just like we have in Britain, you know, that the white workers, British people, uh, you know, more educated and more civilised and sophisticated that was developed especially in the past. We still have that today, of course. I think in China you can see the development of a similar ideology as a means to distract people from the real problems, of course. Um, now, anyway, as I said, Lenin emphasises the export of capital as a, really the key feature, not just the export of commodities, and otherwise outsourcing and investing in other countries. Uh, now, China, as I said, is the biggest trader in the world. Um, which provides a basis for this but isn't yet the export of capital and in fact um, China really dominates world trade in terms of the shipping routes uh, which are the most you know most world trade is carried out on these giant container ships. Uh, China has uh, I think six of the top ten busiest ports in the world are within China Number one is uh, Shanghai and number three is Shenzhen and I could go through the rest of the list but you get the idea. Uh, whereas the United States first position on the, in terms of the world port, busiest world ports is Los Angeles which is number 18. So you can, China has six in the top ten alone. So you can see there's a, a huge discrepancy between uh, the, the one power in terms of trade and manufacturing and the other. Um, it's estimated that by 2030, one third of all container ships in the world will be Chinese. And it's already the case that one third of the volume of the, of the, of the value in containerized uh, exports in the world are already from China, which is three times the quantity from the United States. 
Um, in 1964, the United States had the world's largest merchant marine, that is, the collection of merchant vessels, essentially. And that was in 1964, it was the world's largest. It's now slipped to position 14, and China is in the second position. So you can see, in general, that in terms of trade, China has really supplanted the United States quite comfortably, um, at least in the Pacific region, and yet it lacks control over the shipping routes that it dominates. The American Navy still controls those routes and can shut them off uh, when they want to. Um, and I would argue that this position in world trade, being the centre really of world trade, must express itself sooner or later in imperialist developments. You don't come to dominate shipping routes without wanting to have control over those shipping routes. You don't dominate the trade of, of most countries in the world, or at least of, 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 of your neck of the woods, without wanting to have some influence and control over those countries and to make sure you know, that you get some, some kind of advantage for that position that you've won. Uh, and I think one statistic in terms of the export of capital that really speaks louder than all others is the fact that for the first time two years ago, Chinese um, exporting in other countries exceeded the, the uh, uh, sorry, investment in other countries exceeded the investment into China. Of course, there's been an enormous amount of investment into China, especially from the United States, but from many other countries. But for the first ever time in the last couple of years, China has begun to actually invest more overseas than it, and that is invested in itself, which is of uh, enormous significance. It shows that it is exporting capital. But how do we explain this? Because you, you might look at it and think, well, uh, if imperialism is about dominating other countries and exploiting them and holding all the levers of power in terms of world finance and the military, how does this happen? Certainly the United States dominates militarily on a, on, to an enormous degree. And most of the world's leading banks are American, the World Bank is American, the IMF is a sort of European-American kind of project. Uh, and America obviously invested in China. America really opened China up. So how has it arrived as a, such a situation where the oppressed country has now seemingly begun to put it, itself in a position of being able to oppress others and dominate others. Well, we have to understand imperialism in a very complicated way, it's, or rather, rather a complex way. Uh, it's not just a simple one-sided affair of total control concentrating more and more in fewer and fewer companies and countries uh, without any counter counteracting features. First of all, we can't be so simple as to analyse imperialism without reference to politics. Now, of course, the Marxist position is, stands out for looking beneath the surface of politics and analysing the economic relations that provide the basis for that. That's true. But that doesn't mean that politics has no role to play. Politics is also decisive. And interestingly, in uh, the, Lenin's book on imperialism, he actually characterises Russia as an imperialist power. However, Russia was not exporting capital at, at all, really. In fact, it, it was massively importing capital from the likes of Britain and France at the time that this was written. So in, by that definition, by Lenin's own definition, it would appear to obviously not be an imperial power. And he did say it was both, it was an imperial power, but it was also oppressed. And you can see that in the First World War, that it was sort of dragged into the First World War by Britain and France because of the investments that Britain and France had really in Russia. Um, and I think he explains it, 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 there's another book he wrote called The Development of Capitalism in Russia, where Lenin talks about how uh, Russia developed capitalism, so, so the Russian state developed uh, in a peculiar way, but as a very powerful state, despite the sort of weak economic development that you had in Russia. Because, you know, Russia is a unique country. It has this giant hinterland. It is a vast country with enormous natural resources. Um, and uh, was, was in a position where it could really develop, uh, although, although its economy might not be that developed, the state could become very powerful because of this enormous hinterland, uh, you know, its, it's, it's scale basically, and it, it could kind of enter into European politics, into imperial politics as a sort of semi-independent power with its own uh, aspirations. And, uh, and so, you know, the, the political factors need to be taken into account of. Although imperialism in general, of course, does have to be based 
on monopoly capital, finance capital, the export of capital, etc. But other countries can enter into the equation on the basis of political relations, even if really they're not able to stand on their own feet as a, as a capitalist power. Although that is quite a unique phenomenon. But it's, the point is, it's not such a simple set of relations as imperial power and dominated uh, country, where, you know, and in which the imperial power has absolute control over the dominated country. And in fact, you find many peculiar you know, variations on, on the theme. So uh, you also have other examples where Portugal and Belgium were imperial powers, but were also dominated by other more powerful imperial powers. Portugal, of course, had a lot of control in Africa and Latin America, but was also a protectorate of Britain. And Belgium also was fought over in the First World War, mainly by Germany and Britain, despite itself having colonies. So you have, you know, many intermediate formations, basically. And I always like the example of, of, uh, of how, um, of in the case of Vietnam and China, how China was a dominated country, obviously, uh, for, in, in the past, very uh, oppressed country by imperialism, but in itself had been participating in the oppression and exploitation of Vietnam, and the Vietnamese have a certain resentment of the Chinese because of this. But Vietnam has also got a reputation for dominating and oppressing Laos and Cambodia, and then in turn within those countries the, the, the dominant uh, ethnicity dominates over and oppresses the ethnic minorities. Now those are not all capitalist imperialist relations, clearly. Cambodia was not a capitalist power of any kind. I'm not trying to say that it is just a mini version of British imperialism. But of course the point is imperialism relies upon all of these contradictions and these different balances of power on the world stage to manage its affairs and therefore gives a certain degree of freedom and uh, in to manoeuvre within the complexity of world relations because of this complicated web of different powers that it has to rely upon and, 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 uh, and utilise to its advantage. And many countries have managed to win a certain influence within uh, the imperialist system, despite being quite weak, by exploiting the tensions between different imperial powers. You know, I would argue that the Philippines is doing that right now with regards to China and America. It's manoeuvring between that deadlock between the powers, playing them off against each other to get investment and uh, become sort of raise itself up to being an important country because of that, the, that, that, that peculiar situation. Specifically, China, of course, had its own revolution, which, was, which is also, of course, a political event. And it had it because, uh, because the, basically because the oppression of imperialism was so extreme, especially with, with the phenomenon of Japanese fascism invading China. But, of course, it was so exploited that it actually provoked a revolution, a thoroughgoing revolution, which ended capitalism and, in doing so, freed the Chinese state from imperial domination. And it's true, before then, China was so dominated by imperialism that it was unable to develop its economy. The Chinese capitalists essentially were just office boys for the American and British firms and just, you know, totally corrupt. They didn't develop anything at all, essentially. Um, but of course, in freeing China from imperialism because of the revolution, that what they managed to create is a very powerful and independent state apparatus which now has been able to develop an imperial capitalism actually, return to capitalism obviously. And I would argue that the Chinese state consciously did this even before it was a, a capitalist power of any sort. That under Deng Xiaoping, it quite deliberately had a strategy of looking at the example of already existing imperialist powers based on capitalism and basically thinking, well, we're going to do that too and we're going to kind of conquer for ourselves a central position. We're going to sort of, you know, shed our oppression. We're going to kind of revenge ourselves, if you like, and become a number one or the number one country in the world, which is our rightful place. That was kind of their attitude. And they systematically, I think, applied that policy, protected, used the strength and the independence of the Chinese state to protect Chinese industries, to prote protect Chinese um, businesses, to steal the business secrets of other companies that, and, and, and sort of copy them to a large extent, and to therefore build itself up to the point where now you would say that China is actually uh, developed into a very powerful position. And I think it's thanks to the Chinese Revolution, at least, not in, maybe not in exclusively, but that is an enormous factor in explaining how China has been able to rise from being an oppressed country to an imperialist power. Um, in addition, though, 
there's more than this. It's not just the political factors. There are economic factors as well within imperialism. It's a two-sided thing. Yes, on the one hand, the already established capitalist powers utilise that wealth that they've accumulated to dominate other countries, to invest in them and to exploit them, and to make themselves rich in doing so. And of course they do that, and to a certain extent that does hold back those countries' development. But as I also said, it also speeds them up. It's a very, imperialism is a very contradictory phenomenon, and that's why you do have these you know, strange phenomena in some societies where you have incredibly antiquated methods of production in the countryside, you know, side by side with the tallest skyscrapers in the world. You have this kind of very lopsided development because they import the most advanced technology from the West. It took the West hundreds of years to develop and they innovate it themselves, of course, as well. Uh, but they don't, it only goes so far. It tends not to sort of filter down. It's, you know, it's sort of is like these little islands of advanced capitalism within a sea of backwardness. And, and imperialism has always been like that. But what that means is that the growth rate of those countries tends to, not of all oppressed countries I would say, but of maybe of certain favoured ones with a particularly good position for, for whatever reason. They, they, they take a lot of investment from, from other countries and therefore they have the fastest rate of growth because they're leaping from a low level to the most advanced science and technology that exists in that day. So they grow enormously rapidly and in fact have certain advantages, as I talked about this privilege of backwardness, they have certain advantages over the West because they can learn the lessons. Uh, you can see clearly how like, countries like Germany clearly learn certain lessons, if you like, as compared with Britain, whose capitalism was much more anarchic and sort of small scale, whereas Germany kind of planned it quite systematically and scientifically, looking at countries like Britain and was able to perfect the system really and, 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 and in doing so become much more advanced really. And, uh, and I would say you, you can see the same thing with Japan, South Korea and now China. Um, and as Lenin points out that uh, those, those dominating countries, on the one hand, yeah, they reap enormous benefits for their position, but in doing so, they kind of become lazy, if you like. You know, they don't really invest in their own countries, they invest in other countries where the profits are bigger. Uh, and, they build, and in doing so, they unwittingly build those countries up into being competitors. Uh, and I, th I think that's essentially what has happened uh, with China. Um, so there's an atrophying of the productive forces in the imperial homelands, if you like, and, uh, and, a, and, a, and an overtaking of them uh, in, in a few, not, not obviously in the whole world, but in a few key countries like China and Japan. And uh, I mean, it's, I can just give a few more statistics that make it really clear as day, but you know, how, how much investment has shifted to the Pacific region and how much uh, the West really has lost ground. America, of course, was in a, a very dominating position after World War II. I think it had about 50% of world GDP was America. Uh, in 1980, the advanced countries, that is Western Europe, North America and Japan, uh, had 51 to 52% of world GDP. Now it's 30%. Um, so you can see this uneven development that's taken place where the West has stagnated and other countries have become the centre of world trade and investments. And so finally, the last thing I want to talk about is the ways in which China is manifesting itself as an imperial power and is taking advantage of the relative retreats of American power. In terms of the export of capital, I've already mentioned that it started to invest more in other countries, but in the last two years, there's been a few really significant developments on this score. So China in particular has done two new things. It's created the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and also it's developed a, a sort of policy or a program called the One, well basically it's usually called the New Silk Road, but its official name is One Belt, One Road. And this is basically a plan to develop a new Silk Road between China and Europe, you know, basically repeating the old Silk Road path, obviously with the latest technology with roads and with high-speed trains. Um, and it's doing that because basically it's, re it's kind of shut off from control of the Pacific, although 70% of China's trade goes through the Pacific on, on, on boats that largely sail to America and to Europe, although not only. 
Um, but as I said, America, the American Navy completely controls that region. Um, so what it's decided to do is to use, it already has a lot of influence over Central Asia anyway, political influence. The trouble is Central Asia is kind of insignificant. It's undeveloped, its infrastructure is weak. It's not seen as, you know, it's not a sort of strategic place really, politically. So what China's basically decided to do is to develop those countries. And that's another thing that Lenin points out in imperialism. Uh, that uh, where a new rising imperial power finds its roots to, to, to wealth blocked off by the, the alliances of the, the already existing powers, they, go, they try and develop new places. So for instance, he says that Germany had no real access to the oil market, which was obviously becoming incredibly important in the early 20th century, which was dominated by Britain and America. So what it did is it developed new oil market, developed new oil fields basically in countries that were previously insignificant really but had found oil and it used its banks to invest in those countries. I think one of them was Romania. Uh, I've never heard about Romanian oil but maybe that, it, it did have some oil in the early 20th century. Anyway, so it developed Romania essentially as an important oil market in order so that it could develop its own oil industry rather than trying to somehow break Britain and America's directly. And I think that's exactly what kind of what China's doing. It's, got, it's, it's finding routes to its domination blocked off and it's going into new places that America has largely neglected. Um, and that really is Central Asia. It's spending about $50 billion uh, on developing the road routes to Europe through Central Asia and also another $46 billion developing a, a corridor through Pakistan. So a, a route that will go through China and then down Pakistan into a, a port that they're building in Gwadar which is going to be protected by 10,000 Pakistani soldiers, China is insisting, protected basically from, from terrorists and people like that that it's worried about. So it's doing this basically in order to have for its, its own sphere of influence, its own, trying to develop the economic importance of these countries by placing them at the centre of a new trade route between Europe uh, and China and also the Middle East and China, which is important for oil. And the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is basically backing this and China is ploughing into it its reserves of wealth. China has accumulated more foreign exchange reserves than any other country in the world. That means basically dollars because so many dollars are spent buying Chinese goods. They've accumulated all these dollars. That's also why they lend so much money to America. They're actually a creditor to the United States. Uh, and they're ploughing some of this money into the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank to develop uh, these new parts of the world. And uh, that, that project is apparently the biggest act of economic diplomacy since the martial aid that America carried out after World War II. So that is of enormous significance. And um, also what's very significant is that every country signed up to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So basically countries sign up to it and put a bit of capital into it and hope to get some of the influence and some contracts out of the, you know, the projects that it helps to fund, the infrastructure projects. It's like the World Bank essentially. It's China's rival to the World Bank, which is controlled by America. And uh, hilariously, even Britain signed up enthusiastically to this, much to the annoyance of, of Barack Obama and the Americans. In fact, the only countries, I think, which didn't sign up to it of any importance were America and Japan. Uh, and they kind of shot themselves in the foot, really, by doing this. Um, so that is, of, of, that, I mean, that is really the clearest evidence you could possibly have that China's an, an imperial power. It's carrying out the biggest act of economic diplomacy since World War II, or since, the mar since martial aid. Um, so it's clearly of enormous uh, significance. Um, there's also the, of course, they're not only trying to develop that part of the world, they're also trying to wrest control of the Pacific away from the United States. As I've said, Amer the American Navy controls this region, but China is trying to take back control of it. So it's building islands in certain parts of it and putting its uh, bases on those islands, as, as you probably know, which is annoying a lot of people. Uh, but it's doing it basically and, and is getting away with it and what I think it's trying to do is it's trying to create what they call facts on the ground. In other words, do little things uh, which are kind of naughty basically but are not so bad that anyone's going to go to war with them and, uh, and it will just gradually build them up, build them up, build them up, build more and more islands and then uh, the, it's basically then you've got a set of facts, as they say, which uh, add up to something quite significant. Suddenly China really controls that part of the world because it has all of these posts, these military posts all over there. 
uh, and, and, and bit by bit, Chinese money, basically, is going to take its toll on the American alliances in the region because all of these countries that America is allied with, like Vietnam, Thailand, Taiwan, etc., they're American allies, but their biggest trading partner is China, and, and eventually that's going to take its toll. And I don't know if you've seen what's happened with the Philippines, but it's quite clear that the Philippines, which has now claimed, or its, it's president, new president has claimed it's going to be part of China's sphere of influence and has just accepted $13 billion of alleged contracts from China. Also, the China China's now said it's going to allow its tourists to go to the Philippines, which is very important for the, for the economy, and it's going to allow Philippine... Uh, f f um, Filipino fruits to be sold within China, which is also of enormous significance for the Philippines. And, um, and America, again, has, has therefore lost that. But it's clear that for a period of time, a section, I think, of the, f of the Filipino bourgeoisie was actually kind of probably pushing for this because they are, China is obviously where the money is at for them, but they were sh sh largely shut out of that market by being America's closest ally. Thailand has also begun to drift into China's sphere of influence because of the coup that took place there, which China praised and America sort of tutted at. Um, and uh, and rich, so Thailand has begun to shift into America's sphere of influence sorry, China's sphere of influence, which is a huge shift. And in fact, Thailand has agreed to buy three Chinese nuclear submarines, which is, you know, of enormous significance, because when you buy hardware like that, that means that you have to, basically China controls those submarines, because China knows, has the technology. It's China can repair them, China can, apparently that might not actually go through, but the fact that it announced it even shows, you know, that it's really thinking twice about allying with America. Uh, and I think what we're going to see, just to sum up, is that not only China, but a lot. Of, basically, America is in retreat. It's it's still the dominant power, and it will be for some time to come. I think that's incontestable. But it can't exert itself like it did before. It's lost prestige, it's lost credibility, and its own working class has no appetite for American imperialism really anymore. They want, and Trump actually reflects that to one extent or another in his own reactionary way. And. Um, uh, so what that China and other countries, but obviously more than anyone else, China will begin to step into that breach, will challenge America, and will take it, will put, try, will test America like like they have, like Russia has done in the Crimea, basically saying, and like China is with the island building, they're basically saying, well, are you going to do anything about this if we take this bit of land? And they're basically embarrassing America because they're showing that it doesn't really have the the, uh, the appetite to fight back. And they're weakening the resolve of its allies in doing so because they're showing that America won't necessarily protect you. That is going to create a period of enormous turbulence and instability in the whole world. As I said, imperialism really has these two phases. It has the phase of total domination of one power. Uh, more or less total domination, in which you have relative prosperity and peace because, you know, there's one master controlling it, there's security, there's confidence to invest. That, I mean, that's a bit of a simplification, but you kind of have that phase of history, which was obviously the post-war period. Uh, but then you have the phases when that breaks down, and that not only means that there's wars and there's revolutions and there's instability and there's a loss of ideological confidence from the ruling class, all of that's true, but it also means you have economic problems because you have a, uh, a lack of confidence, you have a lack of certainty in the world economy uh, and, and in general insecurity. So I think the period ahead we have for us that this, that this signifies is an enormously turbulent one, not like the past, of a period in, even in the Pacific of wars, of instability, of coups, as America and China fight vie for influence in the region and obviously Russia is playing a similar role elsewhere and therefore a period of increasing uncertainty and of ideological kind of questioning within capitalism uh, lie ahead for us. Um, and I think therefore we cannot expect the future to be like the past. <coughs>